What we want to do with Paul is walk through some of his images. And obviously, we've got Tim here, who's the photo speed whiz uh, mm. expert in all things print and photography, mm -hmm. to be honest. And um, we might talk a little bit about black and white printing as well, because obviously that's something Paul does a lot of as, as a primarily black mm -hmm. and white photographer. Yeah. But everybody who knows Paul, I'm going to shock you here. We've got a color image that we're going to talk about of Paul's as well. Um, but we'll get there. We'll get there. So um paul actually just if you can just before we get into the images mm. the other thing we want to talk about obviously is is your mindful approach to photography and and we'll sort of yes. weave that through all the yeah. images but i know it's something that with your discover still uh, workshops uh, online and in person you've you've really it feels to me like you've kind of led the way a little bit with that over in in the uk at least in in terms of i think the interesting bit is connecting people to why why they get involved in their photography and the benefits it can bring them uh, to the rest of their life is that fair to say yeah although i mean there are plenty of other photographers doing sort of mindful type um mm. work in the uk um i think i just go on about it a lot <laughs> <laughs> or, or perhaps I, I i talk you know just talk about it too much i don't know um but it, i think it's really it, it's really important that people start to appreciate actually what they're photographing rather than just photographing um, a certain subject because it's been done to death or they've seen it in a magazine is actually understanding why they're photographing it um, and and photograph things that resonate with them or connect with them or you know or, or talk to them uh, and a lot of us worry about what we photograph because of the judgment that others put on them um, you know whether that's social media camera club competitions um, we worry a lot about the our own validation and and the way other people view our work and trying to to get people to realize that how they see the world is unique nobody sees it like that no moment that we exist in will ever be repeated um unless people watch this back on repeat and then yeah. that's one hell of a groundhog day yeah. to be stuck in um and and, and it's a very um it's something that's largely lost on us in the West because we are very much uh, about doing. We, we do stuff all the time. We're on the go. We're constantly distracted. We don't actually make time to, to sit, just to sit back for a few minutes and invest a bit of time back into ourselves, just, you know, to, to, to recharge. We're always in fight or flight, you know, mm -hmm. looking at our phones, answering emails, text messages. Um, you know, there's a lot of demand on us and we we tend to be thinking about the thing we're going to do next before we've even started the thing we need to do now and as a result we often feel that our days are whizzing by and and we don't we don't recognize things happening we don't we don't pay attention we don't notice um because we're so distracted about what we're supposed to be doing we forget to be yeah. something and mm. the i think in some ways the whole lockdown experience has been quite good for letting people have an enforced pause where they've they've been told okay you've got no choice but to stop now how are you going to fill your days and, and that caused a lot of people quite a lot of confusion because all of a sudden we've gone from racing along at a thousand miles an hour to to being you know screeching to a halt and then we're thinking okay i'm stuck at home what do i do I normally leave home to photograph. I normally leave home to enjoy myself. How can I enjoy myself at home? And, and that's where um, a mindful approach to photography, a contemplative approach comes in because you can look around your house and start to appreciate the beauty of a place that you have chosen to live. And weirdly, under normal times, you can't wait to escape it to go somewhere to photograph. And yet you chose to live there. You know, if you wanted to photograph mountains all the time, why did you choose to live in Scotland? Why did you choose to live in St Albans or Seven Oaks? Um, <clears throat> you know, where there aren't any. And then you're you're constantly judging your home. Your your home is boring. Is not good enough. Is not inspiring, which leads you into a downward spiral. Mm. And that rubs off into the rest of your life because you become dissatisfied. So finding inspiration. In, in your everyday, finding moments of beauty in your everyday 
leads to overall happiness and well-being and uh, a, a greater feeling of contentment within your daily life, which means that you're not so disappointed about being at home, you know, um, and you can find beauty on your doorstep. And, and that leads to unusual entries into competitions, entries that catch the judge's eyes. Um, you know, sort of little surprises that come up because you would never have tried something had you not had that enforced pause. Um, mm. you know, and I've, I've loved it. I've really loved seeing what people have come up with in their own backyards. And I think what's interesting is we're going to walk through some different images of yours, Paul, which, which are <clears throat> some, some of which are of the everyday. Um, but it's, it's the, it's those moments, like you say, that those interesting moments, those beautiful moments, those contemplative moments, whatever it might be. And I think really, without getting too deep too early, I think it's at the essence of being a, a, a photographer. You know, I always find it difficult to know we do put ourselves in boxes, don't we? We are an ex-photographer, a Y photographer. Uh, but really, the art of photography or, or your engagement with it uh, can be everywhere. Yes, of course, there might be things we, we like to put ourselves in certain situations. But I think without putting words in your mouth, Paul, because you're very capable of explaining it. But I think it's that, um, no, it's, it's, the, it's the fact that we can <clears throat> see things everywhere. And, and it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing conversation, let's say that, um, with, yeah. with the world that we, we express Ooh. visually. Um, but Tim, maybe let's, let's get into some of the images, if we can, yeah. because uh, I'm, I'm really happy yes. because Paul's, Paul's sent us a selection. And everyone who knows Paul and or I, or both of us, you know, we, we've done quite a few bits together, <clears throat> works, workshops, um, talks, videos, all sorts of podcasts, you know. But I still I, I still enjoy seeing new and different work from Paul that I haven't seen before. And there's a few in here, which is great, because I was really happy we oh, could good. talk about talk about those. Mm. And you're, you're you <laughs> know, you're, no, no, no. And you're, you know, um, it's funny, isn't it? I talked about getting put in boxes and, and when a group or, or a wider community or an individual, when that happens, it tends to take a long time. It's a lot longer to get to be allowed out of that box in their view yeah. than it was for them to put you in it. Yeah. Uh, and so I think, Paul, with, with you, I think a lot of people early on um, were talking about your long exposure work. Mm. And, and that obviously is some of what you do. But, but what you do is you're, you're a photographer, like I say. And um, so what I wanted to make sure we, we covered on with this was, was how it's every day, anywhere, anytime. That's fair to say, isn't it? Yeah, I'm like, I'm like a martini. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. something like that. <laughs> but, but, people who, but people who know your work will, will know it does vary a little. But I mean, no one, or well, not many people will have seen much like this image now I, i've seen uh contemporary urban sort of abstracts and things from you but this is not that in many ways um it's kind of reminiscent of something from the 50s or 60s in a way yeah. but tell me tell me more um so this is it's stored away and uh, it was taken a couple of days it's actually the last workshop uh, pretty much that i did before lockdown and I fell in love with um, with the town of Stornoway. It's just magical. It has a wonderful cobbled street that winds through the middle, and then these sort of um, like like you say, nineteen thirties, nineteen forties, nineteen fifties sort of housing developments that kind of just spring off it up these little alleyways. Um, and I, I I'm a, a big fan of the the work of Bill Brandt, and I, I was looking at this as I walked up it, and I just thought. Gosh, that could be a Bill Brandt picture. And <laughs> I was just about to say that. I was just about to say. I was going to say. <laughs> and and I, I was looking at the. Um, <clears throat> what I like is the repetition of those four gable ends coming down the hill, and then the shadow that kind of emphasises that on the wall, um, and that little shaft of light coming down. There's a, what there you can't see just off the camera is there's an alleyway coming out into that thing where the, the barrier is. Um, and there's a, uh, the sun is coming straight down there, mm. and and I, I literally just stumbled upon it, and I, I just thought, oh, and I really like photographing in bright sunlight in an urban situation. Um, I love the deep shadows, and I'm not afraid of black. 
and I know we've touched on it before, Sam, you know, we have black ink for a reason and that is to use it and use it with pride. Um, <laughs> the more black ink you use, the happier Tim will be and certainly the happier folks yes, will be, yeah. be overall. <laughs> <laughs> and also the light, light black to put underneath it to make it even blacker. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I mean, I'm well, waiting I gonna... for a printer to come out with 12 blacks. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say Brant would have um, in this picture though Brant would have um, burnt out that that grey on the wall, wouldn't he? He would have made yeah. it all white. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Really? It would have then looked a bit like Santorini. <laughs> yes, <laughs> um, but I like um, I like the fact that because I, I don't like people in my photographs, but I like the fact that at any minute you might expect a kid to come down that alleyway on a bike or somebody to sort of mm. you know skateboard past you. Uh, and there's evidence of people mm. within it. You've got the satellite dish and, you know, the, the handrail that's well used and the, the footpath and everything. And I, I just love it. It's one of my, um, it's one of my favorite pictures. And I don't often enjoy a picture repeatedly. They're very much moments that have been and gone. And I look mm. at them and I remember what was going on. Um, but I, um, I broke my own um, sort of little code this year and I entered it for the Scottish Landscape Photographer of the Year and it got highly commended in the oh. urban section. So no, I'm highly didn't. commendable. <laughs> <laughs> Brad would, Brad um, would be proud. Yeah. He would yeah. be, yeah, he would be, yeah. I don't think he ever won an award in his life. <laughs> <laughs> too dark, too contrasty. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, you know, but Paul, I, I think... Yes, go on. No, sorry, I was just going to say, um, well, we're going to touch on a few different things today, and we're going to talk about printing um, across a couple of the different images and the paper types and, and that kind of thing. But I just want to pick up on a thought about sometimes with these um, sorts of images where you have higher contrast or big kind of darker spots, you know, it feels to me like we're kind of being sucked into that darker spot at the far end towards the gable ends. It, you, you can have this sense of slight foreboding but mm. I wonder how much of that is just coming from the viewer. I, what I'm really angling at is I think there's a bit of a lazy assumption sometimes that if we're feeling a little bit dark, we go and make dark pictures. And I actually sometimes think it's the flip of that. But I don't know yeah. your thoughts on that. I, I would agree with that. I know when I was really struggling with my mental health, most of the images I made were very light and very calm. And yet that was the complete opposite because of what it was... It was where I was aspiring to be. It was what I wanted in my life. Mm. Um, you know, and, and yes, at dark times, I photographed in a dark way. Um, it's usually when I'm kind of halfway that I photograph in a dark way. When I'm sort of sitting on the fence, my tendency is to fall the dark side, um, not to you know, not to go too far into the light. Um, but this is this is a balance um you know this is all about this is all about angles it's not about whether i'm in a bad place or a good place i actually was really happy mm. when i took this i mean it was a beautiful <clears throat> day and i was completely lost in the enjoyment of all the shapes it was like a jigsaw puzzle just putting it together um and i love the fact that the only circular or curved thing in this picture is a satellite dish mm. which i know a lot of people would have taken out but I love it in there because of its it, its kind of unwantedness, if you like. It, it's a flaw in the picture that people would have, you know, touched out. It's very easy to get rid of, but I like it. I think it. it needs to be there. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it needs to be there. I think if you yeah. took it out, it'd be, yeah, I don't know. You'd be something missing. Too I clinical, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, too polished, too perfect. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it's good to have imperfections in your image or things that cause you to look again or cause you to, you know, to just pause on the image. Because what you really want is people to look at your photographs and spend a bit of time on them. You don't want mm. to be, you know, the kind of in the Tinder of photographs where people just flick past. You know, you want to be the swipe left or swipe. I can't. I don't know which side of Tinder I want to be on, <laughs> left or right. <laughs> well, well played, Paul. Yeah. Very <laughs> <laughs> no no i know what you mean i know what you mean. And, and sometimes yeah. you need those yeah those elements to 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 command and, and grab your eye and let you dive into it um i think let, let's just uh move on just because we have a, a number of a number of images to get through 
and I really wanted us to talk a little about this with our our friend leaning on on another one there. Um, and sometimes, Paul, I'm sure everyone watching this um, probably follows you on socials, uh, media <coughs> platforms. But what I enjoy when you post images is that often there's something quite heartfelt or inspirational or something that makes you think. The words that you put with your images are very important as well. Um, so tell us a little bit more about this and maybe some of those meanings that you find in images generally and why it's important for you to share them with, with the words as well. Um, with the, the sharing of, of words, is it's kind of like an online journal for me, really. Um, and if it, if it helps other people, that's, that's wonderful. I used to be a great believer that a picture spoke a thousand words and you didn't need any words to be you know, to go with your images. But I, I sometimes think it's quite nice to have something with them. Um, and I, when I photograph things, I'm drawn to them for a reason. And sometimes that reason isn't apparent straight away, although I come home and I edit straight away. So I, I, I think we're, we've talked about this before, Sam, you know, you either edit in the moment or you edit a long time afterwards. I think you're, you let things brew, don't you? Mm. Um, I, I'm much more, and I think this goes back to my news days of processing straight away. I, I, I come home, it goes straight on the computer and I edit it while I've got a lot of it in my head still and in my heart. And, and then I sit on the picture and usually a, a day or so later, I start to kind of reflect on the picture a little bit, um, and use my journal that I keep every day to sort of tie that up with what I was feeling when I what I was writing with what the picture looks like and that's where the Instagram um, stuff comes from the the writing around the image um, you know so I, I find inspiration in the places but sometimes I just don't know what it is um, and it's odd these are woods just up the road from my house I mean I'm very lucky I mean they, they're literally sort of 10 minutes away and, and I go there a lot um, and the morning of the snow, I just I, I just went up there. I literally parked the car across in the car park and walked across, across. And I saw that stick leaning on it. And you can tell I've not positioned it because of where the, the snow goes. And to be honest, I wouldn't have positioned it as nicely. Um, it's too you know, I'd have probably, <laughs> yeah, I'd have probably <laughs> had it at a different angle or something. Um, and I just thought, oh, how wonderful. <clears throat> I love the way the snow is stuck to the front of it and the front of the tree. Um, and I hadn't got an awful lot of time either. So I was quite grateful to find something that didn't really require any searching. And, and it just it just cried out to me to be um, to be photographed. Um, it's almost... And... Sorry, Tim. No, sorry, no, 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 sorry to interrupt. I was just gonna say it was, um, it's almost like a certain poetry in it almost when you actually mm. kind of think about it a little bit more that perhaps someone's put that there and someone else has found it and i kind of like that mm. idea of kind of it's passing on isn't it and um, yeah. some of it is found yeah. someone else yeah i just kind of like that little bit of kind of hope that someone else is bringing into it i suppose and things yeah yeah i mean there's always there's always little elements in the landscape that you 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 look at and you think how did that get there because it's actually not a branch from um a part a, a one of those pine trees or whatever they are mm. um you know it's from a completely different sort of tree so somebody's obviously left it there as they've come out of the woods to go to the car park possibly in the hope that it will still be there the next time they come with their dog i don't know mm -hmm. um you know but i love the fact that it's just leaning there and has been there overnight and there's a sort of quietness to it there's a there's a peace and there's a sort of you know an end to an adventure or the beginning of another one for somebody else. Um, and I, I, I like those little moments. Uh, and I, I love the tension that is in that by somebody having left it there. You know, because I suppose it would have been only too easy to go up to it and throw it out of the picture because it ruins the verticals in terms of the visual aesthetic. But I like, I like <clears throat> it, you know, and I saw it and I just thought, because I don't like to, I don't like to interfere with what's in front of me. I like to ac accept what I'm presented with. Because by accepting the 
um, the role of everything that's in the scene that you you view, it actually makes life easier as a person to accept the things that are going on in my head or in my life. So by accepting the imperfections or the anomalies in something that I stumble across that I enjoy, rather than getting rid of all the things that don't quite make it perfect, if you like, mm. um, means that I'm actually much more able to accept my inconsistencies and uh, inadequacies or flaws or whatever you want to call them, quirks, uh, annoyances, um, as Sam would describe them, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, let's run with quirks, yeah. Yeah, quirks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, would, you um, would you say with your work it is about that, that calmness and that acceptance more? Because, as you know, I kind of work in that same arena yeah. of mental health and or intent wise perhaps I'm, i mean we work very differently kind of opposite mm. ends really i'm projecting yeah. the horror i suppose and you're doing the the opposite in a way the calm and the reflection i suppose um yeah i i mean i um i find the calm in something very um very therapeutic uh, I mean, I, I still, you know, as much as I try to be calm in all aspects of my life, I do tend to be quite busy and meet myself coming back sometimes. And it's something I vow to kind of get rid of, but it, it, it never quite comes to fruition. But photography for me, it, it's meditation. Um, and I know I've mentioned this to Sam in the past and things, but it generally, genuinely is meditation in a space. I find it very hard because I, I have a very restless mind to sit on a meditation cushion and let my mind just do its thing without it interrupting doing its thing with all the kind of the randomness of the day just kind of biting in. <laughs> but I can go into a scene and I can be completely in the moment aware of all of the things that are happening around me, all of the sensory experience and out of that distills a moment as a photograph. Um, and I come away feeling energized, uplifted, um, you know, deeply grateful. Uh, you know, and, and having really enjoyed that moment, whether that moment was, you know, just a couple of seconds or whether it was a, a longer period of time, but just to have been a witness to, to that and been able to spend a bit of time there is just fantastic. Mm. I think, well, I think if we, Tim, if you can bring up the next image, because this, I think when we talk about images feeling calming and, and how the photographer can uh, impart some of that feeling, obviously what we put in the frame, where we put it, uh, how the image is can affect it. Obviously in colour, uh, we can have colours that evoke certain reactions commonly uh, be they cool and calm subdued or be they more dramatic oranges and reds and things like that whereas with black and white i think maybe i don't know paul let's you know i, I wonder but i think to tonal difference uh and space becomes a, a huge thing to, to do with having that sense of um uh, relaxed you know, mm. having a relaxed feel to the frame. Do you, because I, I know, for example, this image is actually a longish exposure. And someone might look at this and think, well, why? But I, I, I know there might be visual reasons, but I also know it's probably because you just wanted that 60 seconds to enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> mm. There's a lot of that, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think, you know, uh, that... Uh, enjoyment of the moment is is so important uh, you know i always ask if i do talks to camera clubs i always ask how many people enjoy the experience a lot of people enjoy photography but enjoying the experience as you make the photograph is very different to enjoying photography you know uh, my dad enjoys photography because he loves the technical he, mm. he likes apertures and shutter speeds and the you know all of this I don't give two hoots about apertures and shutter speeds. Um, 
You know, I mean, if it had one shutter speed of 60 seconds, I'd be really happy. <laughs> That's fine for me. <laughs> one shutter speed, right. one aperture, and some, some ND filters just to kind of get it about right. Um, that, would, that would be fine. Um, you know, for me, the time as the camera exposes is time to just watch what you're, you know, what is happening to experience the photograph as it's being made. I think it's very hard to in, to experience it in a oomph of a second, but I, I know that when I was shooting sport at Reuters, you could really feel the moment. You you would feel the moment that you needed to press the the shutter. You'd feel it building. You don't just let the motor drive run when you're photographing a Premier League match. You choose the moment. And you watch it build and build and build and build up, and then you release the shutter. And it's the same with landscape photography is the same with still life photography it's the same with street photography and portraits you are experiencing something profound it's a relationship between you and the subject um and your understanding of the subject and the interpretation that you want on it so for me you know it was snowing quite hard i loved the movement in the trees which you can just see you know, there's just enough blur in the trees, um, but it enabled me not to get white blobs over the picture because I don't like white blobs on my pictures. I spend hours touching them out, and that's just life's too short. Um, you know, so to have the space, I, I like the the trees being fenced in. Um, I like the fact they look like they're trying to get out, um, mm -hmm. and then there's all this open space, and um, you know, for them to go and play in, but they can't go and play in the in the space. But space for me allows the subject, no matter how big or small, to breathe. Um, and you know, it's a, it's the difference between having a picture of some trees and a field, and about some trees in a field. You know, uh, we can photograph a, tr a tree, and it'll be a picture of a tree. Um, and we can photograph some trees and some space, and it becomes, you know, the the, the you know, we can make we we kind of imagine stories or we build stories into it or we build a breathing space perhaps yeah yeah no no definitely mm. definitely um and there are certain visual things we can do to help help the viewer kind of along with that but um i think let, let's move on to the next image because i do actually want to just talk uh sorry even before <laughs> before we do <laughs> i'm so happy for, i'm so happy i chose this from um, <laughs> Actually, um, Tim, sorry, just can we, just, yeah, can we go yeah. back a sec? Of course. I just want to talk quickly about printing, Paul, because <clears throat> just while we're here and we've got three other images we're going to look at, but you you very happily say, and you're very comfortable in the fact that you're not Mr. Technical. However, yeah. I also know that when you print, you obviously, as a discerning artist, you want the image to be you know uh true to the to the to the uh to the visuals that you want out of it you know what i'm trying to say yeah. so i i kind of what i'm really asking at here is a lot of people worry about how much work there is to do to set up printers understand papers and profiles and i always use you as an example <laughs> because um you know <laughs> you you can do it very easily from home yeah and I, I'm, I'm playing this up a little because I know you understand it a lot more than you let on. But, you know, you, you do still take a great deal of joy from printing these as well, don't you? Let's just talk about the printing for a little bit. Yeah, I, um, I love printing. I mean, I you know, when I first started in photography, one of the things I loved most was actually printing in the dark room. Um, but to print your pictures, I mean, it's, it's where your picture deserves to end up. You know, they're not photographs until they're printed. They're just digital files. They're just ones and zeros on a computer. Until you've got that tangible connection back with a print and you can feel the paper, weight of the paper, the texture, the smell. Until you've got all that in your hand, it's not a photograph. It's not alive. It's on a screen. It's dead. Um, and it's only when you have a print in your hand you truly start to appreciate the subtleties in an image. You know, because if you're looking at something on a, an iPad or an iPhone or perhaps on your computer and you're just flicking through, you don't appreciate the subtleties. You don't appreciate the detail. When somebody hands you a print, 
instantly you hold it with care, you, you caress it. You know, whereas you hang on to your phone in case you drop it in your coffee. You know, um, <laughs> and you, you caress it and you feel it through your fingertips. It's a very light touch. And that might be the same light touch that the, the photographer or the artist, whatever, has used in creating that thing. It's that sensitive, that very essence of, you know, touch that you just, you just go in and you just go, okay, I need it to be just this. And then you handle the print and you can feel the, the just this. And that sounds really, mm. really bizarre when I say it out loud. But it, it, it is that connection. You know, it's like electricity. You see your print come out and, you know, you, you pick it up and you touch it and you can smell the ink drying into the paper. And it's a, it's a very visceral experience in the same way that photography is an, in, an all-consuming all experience. Mm. So is handling a print. Uh, and mm. you, you get all of that. And you're right, I'm not very technical. Um, I, 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 did a, um, I did a workshop with um, the amazing Doug Chinnery. Um, we were co-leading it, and we, part of it was printing. And he lost me after about five minutes of talking because he had all these, <laughs> these charts and graphs. And, and I was like, what, what is all this stuff that I've never looked at? Where does it come from? How does he find it? And, <laughs> and, it, and it really made me think, actually, how much I don't know. And, and I think printing is, is one of those things. It can be as simple or as complicated as you want to make it. I, I imagine that Doug would make far better prints of my images than I ever would because of his greater knowledge of the art of printing. Um, I had a lot of help from Photospeed in setting up my, um, you know, my print setup, but I don't use, at the moment, I don't use custom profiles. Um, I just use the generic one, and I think I don't even change it. And that's, and I tell you why I don't change it because I'm, I'm frightened I might not ever find it again. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm, I'm being really serious because I, I'm, if it works, I don't need to fix it. Um, yeah, and, and I think at some point, yes, I will. I probably, when I get a new printer, um, I'm just waiting now for the phone call to the phone to go from Toby to say, <laughs> yeah. oh, you need a new principal. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> um, when I get a new printer, I probably will do custom profiles, but this has served me well for the last three or four years. Um, and I'm more than happy with the results. Um, mm. Yeah, and that's I think the, that's the main the, thing, really. I think yeah. as long as you're happy with the results, it was it, if you're getting the results you need from that generic yeah. and it's consistent for you, and you, you, pro you probably know what you need to do to that file when it comes out to make it look good coming out of the printer. It may look completely different on the screen. However, it's what comes out of the printer. And I always say to yeah. people, it profiles about consistency. There's there's the bonus that it does the color accuracy and mm. things for you. But the, the main point is yeah. the consistency. So, yeah. and if you're getting that with a generic and it may be, you need to put a bit more contrast in it, or you might need to reduce the color or, or whatever, reduce yeah. the blacks increase or whatever. But, as long as you know, and now you say you don't want to, you don't want to hide that, you don't want to change it because you might lose that generic. But yeah, you might, and you think, oh, what, what one was I using? And you won't know yeah, which yeah. one to press, and yeah. all those things. And um, I think it's the platinum yeah. barometer that mm. I use, even though I print on the platinum cotton paper, and then it's mm. got its own profile. I, yeah. I've still not, not changed to that profile. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Well, I think the thing is, though, it's the the. You know, maybe sometimes we worry too much as well that the print has to be exactly what we're seeing on the screen. The, the two things can be separate things, and I'm not suggesting yours are different, Paul, but I, the print exists of itself and the screen image exists of itself. They're never going to be the same because of how we look at a screen and how we look at a print. Yeah. You know, so I think as long as what you're getting is 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 representative of what you want the print to be, then it's great, isn't it? Um, yeah. let, let's just uh, jump on because I want to talk about this one because I'm I'm guessing... Paul, oh, I might be wrong. Is was this on your phone? Yes. And I know, I know you're a big proponent of of using 
phones uh, yes. using whatever right but the phone yeah. is such a great tool isn't it to yeah. to make these sorts of little <clears throat> capture these moments yeah, yeah. i mean this, i'm you, you need to imagine the scene um uh we've been test driving cars over the last week because my partner is ready for a new car so we've been test driving cars and we went to a farm shop just to check that it would go into the farm shop and up the gravel drive um, at speed, slightly sideways. Because um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big kid at heart. Um, and we go into the farm shop and they've got this lovely um, spring rhubarb. Uh, and it's just in the crates straight from the field. And I, I, I just stopped and I said to I said to Mario, I said, I'm going to have to just um, not come in with you until I photograph the rhubarb. Now, she's very used to me doing random things like this. So I just spent a very happy five minutes just photographing the rhubarb um, because I just loved the, the the kind of the texture and the freshness and the way it's just sort of standing up but it was kind of very random and it literally just called out to me so I loved it I, I just you know and and then it makes a fantastic crumble <laughs> double, <laughs> double win isn't it I'm so, I, I know I know you're a Mr black and white Yes. But I, I would have thought even you might have been tempted a little bit on colour here. What? Pink and green? Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. Goodness sake, Sam. <clears throat> I mean, uh, no. I, everybody knows it's rhubarb. Everybody knows the colour of rhubarb. So why do they need that information from me? I'm giving them texture and... Mm line a little bit of order out of chaos um yeah, perhaps a smile because you know it's randomly rhubarb in a shop um i don't know um you know i i photographed it for me i saw it in black and white i saw the colors i think as a black and white photographer color is really important because mm. you can adjust the way the tones work off the color mm. but color's not important in the way I photograph as a communication method to, yeah. to people. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. On the whole. But I, I know what you're going to do next. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I was I was teasing, but I think the, the point is really you you do see the colour. It's not like you're not seeing the colour because the colour is yeah. absolutely informing your black and white decisions yeah. because you, you know how that's going to work in black and white and often you'll be looking at it in black and white anyway yeah. through the device. But, okay, cool. Well, we've got a couple more images that we want to just get into. Uh, thank you, everyone, for watching along. Um, but, uh, yes, we're saving the, the, the other one for last, uh, it seems. <laughs> <laughs> the no, shock. <laughs> We've talked about sort of space and simplicity, Paul, and, and, and you know, I think we uh, need to know sometimes when uh, enough is enough within the frame uh, to convey the message, I suppose, is what it's mm. all about, isn't it? And, and simple, there's often themes with your work where there is just one little star and you just let it be itself amongst its, its wider settings. And this is a good yeah. example of it. Thank you. Um you know, I was just, when we photo, I was actually in the middle of doing a film for um, Lee and Fuji with Wex. We were doing this filming and the the cameraman had forgotten his cards as, you know, <laughs> as a video camera person does. <laughs> and he had to go <laughs> off back to, the, uh, back to the car park. And I was just sat on top of the, uh, the cliffs near Beachy Head, um, which is quite a strange place for me to go because of past experiences with it. And I was just watching the waves. It was such a quiet day. The waves were coming in pa literally parallel to each other, but lovely spacing. But they were just like little wave, little wave. Li and I just thought, oh, that's so calming. Um, and I just got hooked into the rhythm of them so that I was watching. And I don't normally work um, without a tripod, but I was literally just sat there with a... Uh, the camera in my hand just watching them come in and just I got into the rhythm of it so that I could almost have my eyes closed and photograph the break of the wave based on just the the, the rhythm of the whole moment um, and it was so lovely uh, you know that it was so slow um, the build-up I just found it really calming 
Um, you know, and it wasn't a noisy crashing wave. They're not very big waves. They're only, you know, they're probably ripples. I mean, you certainly can't surf off them. But the, you know, again, it was it was just watching and enjoying the moment and feeling the experience, living the experience. You know, living the moment, live the photograph. Um, it's amazing when you when you tune in. Sorry, Paul, to that yeah. that natural rhythm. You know, we've talked about this as well. When, you know, especially with water, you can start to see it. You start to feel it, and it's you, you know you joke there. You can shut your eyes, and but there's these. There are often repetitions in the landscape with things yeah. that are moving and with things that aren't moving mm. in a, in a weird yeah. way. Um, and so that's a really great feeling because then you feel like suddenly you're part of it as well. Yeah. Instead of mm. just being a bystander, you, there's a conversation yeah. as hippie as that sounds, isn't there? <clears throat> yeah, uh, and and it is your relationship. It's becoming part of, becoming involved in the photograph. You know, you're not a kind of an innocent bystander. You're involved in it. You can feel you. It's like being able to feel the heartbeat of the earth. Mm. You know, mm. and and to allow yourself to give yourself permission to be that connected to to the the moment. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. You know, and it reminds you of how impermanent everything is, how much mm. everything changes all the time. Um, and although the rhythm was the same, no two waves were the same. They didn't break in the same place. Um, and that was what was really fascinating about it. You know, st being able to sort of almost study the transients, um, you know, and every time the wave comes in, you know the tide is going in a bit further or out a bit further. You know, it, it's, a, it's a picture of change, mm. you know, constant, constant change. Um, mm. Well, let's let's talk about change because the the next image. <laughs> you ready? You ready? <laughs> a, excellent segues, Paul. Yeah. <clears throat> what? <laughs> so, <laughs> joking aside, obviously, anybody who doesn't know Paul. Well, anyone who does know Paul, sorry, would would know they very, very, very rarely see color color work from you. So, I suppose, you know, the obvious question is, what compelled you? <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to say, "What the hell." <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Well, I was, I was getting to that. No, what I, I kind of have my own thoughts why, but you know, why, why did you? Yeah, you know, it's not hard and fast rule, is it? You, you know, you, you are okay to break your own rules, so to speak. But something yeah. obviously just shouted to you about this to, to represent it in the way you have. Okay, so it's, it's done on a phone, and it's, um, it's a multiple exposure, um, and, and it's just playing, uh, because. To, to be able to evolve as a photographer, we don't ever stay the same. You know, we have to develop and we have to, you know, we have to not be in the box that people want to put us in. I mean, for a long time, I was classed as a long exposure black and white landscape photographer. You know, I mean, that's a very long, narrow box <laughs> to go in if you want to put the title with your printer on the front. Yeah, dot um, com. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's a catchy name for my next uh, my next project. <laughs> <laughs> and and I think it's important that we don't let that define us. You know, in my past mm. in my past life, as when I was working at the Times, I defined myself and allowed myself to be defined as the picture editor of the Times. I lost my own identity, and as a photographer, as an artist of any kind, you don't want to lose your own identity. You don't want to lose who you are because you're conforming to what other people expect. You know, it, it's, it's like an actor who only plays one particular part. They become typecast. And then it's very difficult for us going to the movies to see them play anything other than, you know, Harry Potter or James Bond or whatever. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and it's the same with us as photographers. So we have to have this sort of childlike approach to things where we go, okay, I'm just going to play. I'm going to have fun. Um, you know, so this is using photo split on the iPhone. And um, it's the, the, the red is actually the homework folder of my stepdaughter. And the, um, the, the silhouette of the vase is actually a little vase that was on the mantelpiece um, shelf thing in the kitchen. Um, and I just started combining them because I love the shape of the vase. Um, and I, I, I don't normally play with color. 
but I, I was kind of playing with a blend of color and black and white and you know it was just fun I, mean, I could have sent you 20 versions of this all different colors because I played I, I, I spent a very happy hour playing with it and I always encourage people to play with their photography because you don't have to show it you don't have to share it. and if it wasn't for things like this I probably wouldn't share it but I, I think it's good to for people to know that you don't have to stay in the box that people expect you to put you know expect mm. you to live in you can break out of it and you can use that as a transition into another another project another uh, genre of photography um another sort of you know media um you know because photography is only is only one way of expressing ourselves um, you know, I've seen work of, of Joe Cornish's where he's drawn on the prints. You know, I mean, that's something I do a lot. You know, I, I'm often scribbling on my prints in uh, pencil or pastel just to see what happens, just to build them up. Mm. Um, and, you know, that's something I've done since I was at, at college. Um, you know, it's, it's great fun to take your lovely print and then work a different media over the top of it. It's great fun to take multiple exposures and play with them and see what happens. Um, mm. you know, and we have to have fun. A lot of people take photography far too seriously. Photography is experimentation. It's expression. Uh, it's enjoyment. And for the majority of people in the UK, it's a hobby. And a hobby, by definition, is an investment in your quality time. So if you can't enjoy the quality time, if you can't give yourself permission to have fun, why on earth are you doing something that you can't have fun at? Why? I don't understand. You know, it's my job and I love it. I, you know, if I, if I couldn't be a photographer, I'd want to be a Lego designer so I could play with Lego mm. all day. <laughs> Photography is the same. <laughs> you know, you're just playing with colors and blocks and shapes and patterns. Uh, and that's all it is. It's visual play. Um, mm. And I, I think that we should encourage more people to play and not be frightened of pushing out of their comfort zones, not be frightened of breaking the formula that they know works, and and pushing something out there, out there. Yeah, it lets you grow, doesn't it? And I, I, yeah. I yeah. I'm happy you've been able to share this color image in a safe space, Paul. And, <laughs> and, uh, well, as long as there's only the two of you. Yeah, it's only no, yeah, it's no one else will ever see it. Yeah. yeah, it's fine. And actually, just as a final thought, I I know this would make an absolutely corking print by the way i can just imagine on something really mm. nice and textured and, and mm. gorgeous print that would be anyway that's for another day but paul yes. um thank you very much for, for yes. coming on absolutely thank you, paul. talk to you about photography <clears throat> and the wider wider points around it you know it's not always the hows and i know i'm guilty of that i like to talk about the whys mm. but that's why we have paul <laughs> on because he likes to as well <laughs> yeah. uh, because that's the interesting <laughs> bit right <laughs> yeah exactly yeah yeah the, the yeah. how is the easy bit the why is the harder bit yeah you understand exactly. why you photograph what you do and why you want your work to look a certain way yeah that's yeah the, that's the harder more challenging bit and the fun yeah. bit and the fun bit exactly yeah. yeah exactly cool okay well thank you very much paul thank you tim uh yeah, and thank you Thank you for watching, everyone. We're, we'll be back with another Photospeed Talk very soon. Goodbye for now. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.